Good morning, everybody. Happy Thursday. Great to see you. Welcome back. If you're on Facebook watching this, please hit the share button. Tag somebody that you know that you saw on yesterday. It's not quite on yet. If you're on Facebook, let somebody know that we are on. We are live. Welcome back if you've been with us before. If you're new, I am Pastor Sean Marshall. I'm a pastor. I am husband, father, consultant, coach, and an author of a book, Transition Decisions, How to Get Unstuck, Embrace Change, Make Your Next Move Now. And I've been doing a series of videos, having a conversation about what I believe is something really important that can help you in 2024 to make this your most transforming year yet. You don't need another resolution. You need a revelation. You need a revelation of how God wants to work in your life, what God wants to do to accomplish his purpose. Because if you have a revelation of what God wants to do, then you can respond to the work that God is doing. If you've missed any of the previous videos, you can go to my YouTube channel. They're all there. And make sure that you subscribe uh, so that you can continue to stay part of this conversation. This is going to be my commitment to you through the year that I am supporting you in this way. So we started off talking about how to receive a revelation on Monday. And on Tuesday, we talked about God wants to reveal the real you to you. God wants to reveal more of your identity. Yesterday, we talked about God wants to reveal unexpected favor that can help you make up for lost time, for failures, and for lost opportunity. God wants to reveal unexpected favor. And so today is day four. And I believe that what God wants to do in your life in 2024 is that He wants to reveal the purpose of your pain. Uh, there's something I used to say, and I say it still. I remember uh, hearing a preacher say it years ago for the first time. And uh, I've referenced it so much that now I just say I said it. You know, that's what preachers do to each other, by the way. We do this all the time. And uh, this preacher said, I thought that when I got saved and became a Christian that I wouldn't go to hell. And what I realized, what I found out is that you don't go to hell, but hell comes to you. And what he's talking about in the reality of that statement, thank you all so much for sharing. What he's talking about is the reality that even after you become a Christian, you will experience pain. And this is a counterintuitive idea, right? It can be hurtful to think about the fact that even in Christ, we will suffer, we will experience hardship. We will go through things. And it's hard because we think, well, I'm a Christian. Why did I go through that? So we pray for God to do something, and God doesn't do what we want him to do. We try to avoid a situation, and we cannot avoid it. We pray for good health. And then we get a diagnosis. We labor, and we serve the Lord, and then we end up in a crisis. And many of us are carrying pain and trauma and things that we cannot wrap our minds around that happened to us when we were younger, when we didn't have the power to speak up for ourselves, when we could not defend ourselves. And the question that we have in that is, well, why would God allow this to happen? How could this happen, right? Situations happen and things unfold in our lives that we don't plan, prepare for, or anticipate. And we get stuck because we experience pain that we don't know how to process or to handle. And I believe that there are many believers, many people in the kingdom who are sidelined because of unconscious, unprocessed, and unreconciled pain. So today, what I want to do is help you to know that God has a purpose for the pain, that being a Christian does not mean that you won't experience pain. But being a Christian means that God lifts us up and repurposes our pain. 
And in the beginning of 2024 and throughout this year, God, I believe, wants to reveal to you how he wants to reconcile, redeem, and repurpose your pain. So we're in Romans 8, and we're going to be hanging around verse 18, Romans 8 and 18. Now, here's a bit of context, right? Paul is writing to the church at Rome, the book of Romans, and we know that in this book, he's addressing theological tensions. He's laying out doctrine around sin and salvation. He's addressing some of the moral challenges in the early church. We get to chapter eight of Romans. Uh, he shifts to talking about the liberation from sin. He laid out this doctrine and understanding of how sin works. Right, he moves all the way from the wages of sin are our death, but the gift of God's eternal life in Christ Jesus. And then he works his way to chapter seven. The good that I would do, I do, do not, but the evil that I would not, I do. And I find this law that works in my members. Who shall deliver me from the body of the sin and death, right? So in chapter eight, he starts talking about the fact that we've been liberated from sin and we live a life in the spirit. And you know, there's therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Right For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. And in the context of talking about life in the spirit, he starts talking about pain and suffering. And it seems counterintuitive to us that we would be having a conversation about sin and death and freedom from sin and death in the spirit and a life in the spirit, and then start talking about suffering. Seems like those two things don't go together. But Paul understood his audience. He knew that the Roman church was suffering, right? They were suffering in political oppression and religious conflict. So this wasn't some abstract message about suffering and pain. He's addressing the real, tangible reality of hardship for those who are living in the spirit, of people who were living in life in the spirit with a recognition that pain and suffering can happen on personal, social, and spiritual levels in our lives. So there's personal suffering of these early Christians that manifested in their persecution. They were going to prison. They were being beaten. They were threatened with death, right? Then socially, they were marginalized. They were being ridiculed and ostracized for not fitting into the Roman religious norms. Um, they were boycotting um, the wicked powers and resisting the wicked powers of the time. And so they were suffering um, rejection and ostracizing and oppression under this wicked regime and government. So there was social pain and then there was spiritual pain because for them, this shift from uh, into Christianity from their traditional religious beliefs was a profound transition. It's a radically different faith that led to lots of conflicts and challenges and spiritual identity and doctrine and how, what do we do with the law now and what do we do with works now? And these were these conversations were tearing relationships and families apart. And the between that conflict and the constant threat of persecution and doubts and fears and everything they were going through, they were confronted every day with the question of whether or not being a Christian was worth all this pain. This is why verse 18 of chapter 8 matters so much. Paul knows who's he's, who he's trying to talk to. He knows who he's trying to encourage. He's trying to encourage a people who are trying to figure out how to understand the intense personal, social, and spiritual pain that they're going through. And he says to these people, essentially what he says is the pain that you're going through right now can be redeemed for God's glory. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory, compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. He says, what you're going through right now, the pain that you're suffering right now is not gonna be greater 
than the glory that God's going to reveal to you. Now, this is really interesting to me, y'all. It's really interesting to see this dynamic. It's interesting to me because this is Paul, who was once known as Saul, who was responsible for some of their previous suffering. This apostle Paul is comforting these Christians in suffering. The Bible says in Acts 8 that when Stephen was killed for declaring the gospel faithfully, that Saul was one of the people consenting to his death. Saul was a persecutor and a tormentor of Christians. He thought he was being zealous. He thought he was being faithful to what he understood to be his faith at the time. And so, you know, Saul has this encounter with Jesus on the Damascus Road. And in that encounter with Jesus, Jesus says, I am Jesus whom you persecute. And Jesus begins to change Saul's life and then he becomes known in the in the early church as the apostle Paul, right? Here's an unpopular fact that we glean from this. This, this is an inconvenient truth, right? God often uses the people and the things that damaged us to develop us. <laughs> God will often <clears throat> use the things and the people. God will often take those ruptures and make them redemptive. Can you imagine being an early Christian and reading this letter and remembering? Can you imagine being at the assassination of Stephen, seeing Saul? Yeah, that's a good thing we're doing there. And all of a sudden, you look up, and now you're reading this letter from Paul. I, I assure you that the pain that you're going through is not worthy to be compared. Really, God? But God is using Paul, who was once a source of pain, to bring encouragement to the church for the pain that they're now experiencing. Please hear me. If you are willing to revisit some of your injuries, you will find some valuable information. If you're willing to receive from some of your places of pain, you will find that there will be revelation that comes to you from the Lord, from the painful things you've gone through, from the betrayal, from the hurt, from the rejection, from the abandonment, from the abuse, from the oppression. No, those things were not good. I don't want you to be confused at all. Those things that you went through that were painful were not good. But Bible says, the Bible says that God can make all things work together for the good of those who love God to those who are the called, hallelujah, according to, to his purpose. So here's what I believe God wants to help you see in 2024. If you went through it, if you overcame it, if you didn't die in it, there's glory to be revealed on the other side of it. If you went through it, if you overcame it, God wants to do something more valuable, greater than the suffering that you went through. If I told you that I had a precious diamond and that diamond was worth $25,000, but I'm going to sell it to you for $15,000. Yeah, you would jump to buy that. Why? Because the thing that you're getting is more valuable than what it costs you. Right? So Paul is saying that the glory that's going to be revealed on the other side of our pain is more valuable than the pain itself because God redeems pain for his purpose. This explains the transition from verse 18 to verse 19. So in verse 18, we heard, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us, right? But then in verse 19, so, so that statement, right, moves us into verse 19, Romans 8 and verse 19. This is one of my favorite scriptures. In fact, it is the foundation verse of the ministry that I lead called Manifest Network. 
helps people be who God created them to be, do what God created them to do and live the life that God created them to live. Romans 8, 19, for the creation waits an eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. Some of your translations may read that creation is groaning for the sons of God to manifest, right? And I love this scripture because Paul, what he's doing is he's relocating our suffering to from our local context to a cosmic context. He says, essentially, this is bigger than you and me. It's not only about our personal pain. It's about the future glory. And it's about the entire world, creation, groaning and waiting for a restoration that will only come to the world through his children. He's saying that the world is waiting for us to experience the redemption of suffering because there's a glory that God reveals in repurposed pain. And that repurposed pain has far reaching implications for the sinful realities that we see in the world. And so instead of avoiding suffering, if we can embrace suffering and learn the discipline of suffering through pain, instead of trying to pray all pain away, there is a powerful glory that gets revealed in the earth that ushers in the kind of reality that the world has been travailing to see. That's good. And I can say that's good because that's from God right there, right? That if we can see pain as not just a thing to be avoided, but a source of divine information, that we can embrace the fact that God wants to lead us through pain on a path to his bigger plan. The world needs the glory that can only be revealed in our lives when we catch God's redemptive revelation concerning our pain. So watch this. Because everybody wants to know their purpose, right? Everybody wants to know their purpose. What's my purpose? I want to know my purpose in 2024. You will have a hard time recognizing your purpose if you have not yet reconciled your pain. Okay? Because the glory of God is made evident on the other side of pain, on the other side of suffering. Your purpose is made clear on the other side of your pain. There's some things that you've suffered through in life. There's some things that God has taken us through that he wants to repurpose, not just for us. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love him and are the called according to his purpose. We misquote that scripture. We say God's working it for my good. He's working it for my good, right? Well, yeah, it's 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 for your good, but it's also for them and they, those who are the call. So on a personal and a communal corporate bigger level, God not only ultimately reveals his purpose for allowing you to go through pain, but the power and the glory that comes on the other side of it. See, because when you realize that even though you were abused, you didn't die in the abuse and you didn't become an abuser, you realize that God is a healer. And not only do you become grateful for God's healing power in your life, you realize that God can use your life to heal others. My God today. When you had an addiction, but God sets you free and helps you see who you really are, you realize that God is a deliverer. And you catch the revelation that God not only loves you so much that he'll bring you out of an addiction and bring you out of bondage, but God can use your life to bring deliverance to other people who are hurting. So you start to catch the understanding that if I go through something in Christ, when I experience pain in the spirit, and I reconcile that pain and let God reveal to me the purpose of that pain, that purpose gives me the power to give him glory and bring the world what it's been waiting for. 
let me calm down and let y'all go because I'll keep going in that. All right. So here are the questions. <laughs> here are the questions. Nope. I'm going to stay focused. Not at all. Here are the questions that I want you to contemplate on to position yourself to receive the revelation of your pain. All right. Number one, question number one, how do I need to reconcile my pain? Right. Many of us are in that space I talked about earlier about being stuck and we're still trying to compute the stuff we've gone through. It doesn't make sense. It's hurtful. So we're denying our pain. And we haven't allowed God, his spirit or his word to walk us through those painful places in our hearts, in our minds, in our memories, in our psyche. What we've actually done is we've used the, the gospel as a cover up and a crutch and an inebriation instead of a transformation. Okay, so we've not reconciled our pain because we've not allowed God to do deep work in our hearts and our souls. So what do I need to do to reconcile my pain? Some of you all might need to ask, do I need to sit with a therapist? Y'all, I got two of them. And with their support, I got one, I got a therapist for my therapy. <laughs> I got a backup just in case one, you know, doesn't get me, the other one will. And with their support over the last five years, I've been able to do deep, uncomfortable, and transforming work, exhuming and examining my own pain. And that work has helped to clarify my purpose. Okay. So do I need to sit with a counselor or a therapist? Do I need to sit in prayer and confront not just the surface realities of my pain before God, but the deeper emotions? Do I need to unearth the anger, the confusion, and the doubt? Do you know that the psalmists expressed real, raw feelings to God? Do I need to, to capture that vulnerability? Do I need to maybe trust God with the deeper pain and anguish of my soul? I remember when one of my grandmothers passed away. I was mad at God. I was mad at God because she died literally three days before I would have seen her again. One of my mentors was praying with me and she said, you're mad at God, aren't you? And I couldn't even open my mouth. My, my eyes were hot with tears. I was so mad. I was grieving and I was mad. She said, guess what? God already knows it. God already knows it. Yvette Breckenridge, thank you, said, God already knows you're mad at him. Tell him because that's prayer too. So do I need to pray? my honest feelings so that I can reconcile and name and acknowledge what I've gone through. Question number two, what is God revealing to me about my pain? Can I let God give meaning to the suffering? C.S. Lewis in his book, The Problem of Pain, he says, God whispers to us in our pleasures. He speaks in our conscience but he shouts in our pain. It's his megaphone to awaken a deaf world. What does God have to say about my suffering? What, what is the redemptive revelation of these experiences? What wisdom does God want to give? There's another powerful quote from Aeschylus, the ancient Greek playwright who's recognized as the father of tragedy. Uh, Robert Kennedy quotes him when he has to announce at a campaign stop in Indianapolis in the April of 1968, April 4th, that fateful day that Dr. King was killed. He quotes him and he says, he who learns must suffer. And even in our deeps, even in our sleep, pain that cannot forget falls drop by drop upon the heart. And in our own despair against our will comes wisdom to us by the awful grace of God, by the awful grace of God. Can, can we receive wisdom by the grace of God that comes in those deep places of pain? What does God have to say? What meaning do I need to gain from God about this pain? And question number three, how can God repurpose my pain for his glory to bless the world? Because you didn't go through that for nothing. God does not waste pain. God does not waste pain. He will never waste pain. Type that in the chat, please. 
We're almost done. I'm going to pray. God does not waste pain. Donnie McClurkin came to my church once and I happened to bump into him as he was leaving. And he prophesied to me. He said, your life broken and put back together is going to change lives. That really ministered to me. God wants to use our pain, not just to bless us, but to bless the world. Your brokenness can become blessing for many others if you allow God to reveal to you his purpose for your pain. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for the power that you have by your incredible grace to redeem our pain, to redeem our suffering. Give us the courage to examine the hurt that we carry, to sit in the suffering, to feel the weight of it, and to hear your spirit speaking to us, revelation and insight that will shift us, transform us, and equip us to be and do all that you have ordained for us to be and to do. Speak to your people in these questions, in Jesus' name. A Amen and amen. Don't forget the questions. How can I reconcile my pain? What is it that God wants to reveal to me about my pain? And how can God repurpose my pain for his glory? All right, we're done. That's it. We're done. Share this. Those of y'all who are watching on the replay, thank you. God bless you. If you have not yet subscribed, make sure that you're on my YouTube channel. We'll be right back here tomorrow morning. And uh, as a matter of fact, tomorrow morning, I'm going to announce something else to you about how we're going to conclude this series. So make sure that you tap in tomorrow at 7 a.m. God bless you. Have a great day. Talk to you. Be safe out there. Bye-bye.